Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Colony Drop, a Gundam podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Isaac. This is your favorite Gundam podcast, where we talk about everything from Gundam models, a.k.a. Gunpla, to anime series, to movies, to the upcoming live-action movie, to everything Gundam in any way, shape, or form. We do it all. What are we talking about today, Isaac? Today, it's another mailbag episode. All right. Mail call, everybody. You left comments. Some of them are great. Some of them aren't great. Some of them we got to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need like a like a mailbag sound effect, like a soundboard. Like w- what is the mail call sound effect? I'm going to like have to comb through episodes. I'm pretty sure there's like a... <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's an episode where like they do get mail. Maybe it was in double eighty three. Oh, we could um oh I know what we gotta do. There's like this really cool sound effect when they get a message, like that little chiming noise, like ding ding ding. Like when they <laughs> like it's it's like, you know, oh god, it's the laws or something like that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we could play it uh, before each comment. Yeah. <laughs> or like um I don't know, when uh, when Lieutenant Burning was like he opened up the briefcase and he's reading what they're planning and then he died. <laughs> He's it's like, really oh my perfect, god, right? or something. <laughs> Stardust is really bush, or something. <laughs> Subtlety was not on display in that scene. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so close, burning, so close. <laughs> All right, Isaac, we have a lot of comments to get through today. What do you think? Should we just go to the top of the list and go through them? Let's do it. I'll kick us off. <laughs> this one is from Hyakushiki23. Oh, Hyakushiki, you've been a, an OG fan. All right, we, we're big supporters of you, just like you're big supporters of us. I would go into combat with you in any combat zone, except maybe <laughs> a gassing of a car. <laughs> Anything has, else, though, we'll do great. <laughs> no, Isaac has standards. Yeah, like I might be Zeon, but even I have limits. Uh, I'm good, Zeon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Hyakushiki23, your comment is, this is not OG footage, but this is how the Federation did repairs to GMs on ships. And he provided a YouTube link, and it leads us to a clip from... Am I pronouncing this right? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, there's an English name. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a clip from a video game. I believe it's on PS3. It's called Battlefield Record UC0081. Uh, it must be, like, the opening movie or some sort of cutscene where it shows... Um, and this goes back to our Capital Ships episode where we were discussing how, like, hilariously short-sighted it was for the Federation to have an entire fleet of Salamises and Magellans that can't store mobile suits uh, in a war that is decided by mobile suits. <laughs> and uh, and we were wondering how they did maintenance on the GMs since they were just kind of like attached on the outside in, in sort of like a very jerry-rigged manner. Uh, and this, and this, this clip, though, actually shows the GMs uh, being worked on. Uh, right, Isaac? Yeah, and it was... It's about as rough shot as I thought. <laughs> they're they're just literally kind of strapped to the side or the underside, I guess, of each ship. And, you know, the engineering team or support team pops out from a hatch. They just get to work on repairing it or whatever. There's like these kind of manacles that like <laughs> clamp on to like the 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 limbs and there's like the shoulder kind of locking system that attaches to each GM that's kind of like laying its back up against the underside of each capital ship and it's yeah only the federation could throw this together on short notice with their vast resources <laughs> say, <laughs> say what you will about Xeon, but we actually have hangar bays for our mobile students <laughs> this was a great eye by hyakushiki 23 i mean you could not have found a better clip to demonstrate uh, exactly what we're talking about i mean how deep is your cannon to have such a such a clip be readily available but it doesn't really work out too well for the gms does it isaac no, no, it doesn't. They're, um, shall we say, exposed to attack, Brian? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Three mobile armors approach, which I believe are big rows, and they just kind of massacre the GMs, right? <laughs> In the GM's defense, those mobile armors were going to just destroy the capital ship anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so. Whether they were inside or outside, I suppose. Yeah, there's no... In a rock, paper, well, you don't even need a mobile armor to destroy like a, a capital ship, right? You could just use a regular mobile suit. They're, they're, they're that good. So fate determined that that was the <laughs> end of that capital ship. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I mean, a really neat piece of Gundam mechanical lore, you know, if you want to go watch it. And overall, great clip, really. I mean, some of those video games, they seem to have some pretty cool cutscenes. Uh, I kind of wish there were some compilations out there. Uh, I mean, maybe there are. Who knows? Yeah, maybe like, I don't know. 
oh wow maybe that'll be on our to-do list like we'll do like a let's play <laughs> or something <laughs> of just the cutscenes. <laughs> yeah god that i don't know when i get like when i build like my gaming pc or something or i don't know we'll figure it out <laughs> anyways yeah or at least we'll just take all the cutscenes. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but yeah wow. the, it was finally answered the federation kind of slapped it all together to work on gms on on their capital ships and i'm not surprised what a joke <laughs> <laughs> so good eye Yakushiki 23 and thanks for sending it in uh, second comment is also from Yakushiki 23 uh-huh. <laughs> and so this goes back to our F91 review episode Isaac and Hyakushiki 23 took away not what I'm sure what we wanted people to take away from this episode uh, we both had some harsh words for F91 even though I think we both saw the potential uh, we, you know but we both agreed that it maybe was not the strongest film in the franchise. Um, and so in Hiyakushiki's mind, you know, he, he said, look, I'm glad you guys did this. That way I don't have to watch this movie. I know I can skip it because I know it's not very good. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a reasonable opinion. Uh, but I don't know, Isaac. I think if you're a Gundam fan uh, or at least a Universal Century fan, I think you, you got to watch F91 at least once, right? I'm not saying you got to watch it a lot, but I think it's worth one viewing for sure. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. This might be your only opportunity to see like the Crossbone Vanguard and the birth of miniature mobile suits. So you kind of have to see it. I don't necessarily say you have to own it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can <laughs> use your your big brain to find ways to watch it online for free. <laughs> but um, <laughs> once you do that, just give it one one look at. And, and while we're on the subject, Brian, there are certain things that you should watch at least once as a Gundam fan, right? Almost all okay. Gundam media, I would say. You should watch at least once. I would even put G Savior, <laughs> or your, your favorite film, on that list. Like G Savior has to be experienced. F91 has to be experienced. These are things, as a Gundam fan, you kind of have to do. Look, if you're going into this franchise as a Gundam fan, and you know you're going to watch Universal Century, you, you know you're in it for the long haul, right? There's I don't even know how many TV series, you know, manga, video games, you lose count. You kind of owe it to yourself as a fan to kind of try to soak it all up uh, at least once. And F91 is pretty important, actually, you know, for the timeline. I mean, especially if you want to go forward to Crossbone. So if anyone out there took that away of don't watch F91, you know, I don't think that's what we set out to do. I think we set out to give the film context. Is that fair, Isaac? Yeah, I mean, with the whole UC Next 100, it's kind of mandatory viewing in a way just to maybe orient yourself as far as what what was sort of the last known canon content before this leap into the next century that that Sunrise really worked on. Okay, it was more or less F9. Just, just moving forward from there, just orient yourself. Think of it as historical viewing. It's your homework, listeners. you got to watch F9 <laughs> one, all right? It's not that long. It's not going to take a whole day. It's not a whole season or series. Just, just consume it once and then sit back and say, okay, I see why they didn't make that into a whole show. <laughs> it's certainly not a full series, but damn if they didn't cram a full series into two hours. Oh, boy, yeah, they... They butcher that writing like the fattened calf. <laughs> <laughs> this next question is from Snood Master K on YouTube. Love that name. I don't really know what it's from, but it's funny, and I like it. His question is, what is the most cost-effective way to get Zeta Gundam? Because it's not on streaming. Uh, and again, as we mentioned last week or a few weeks ago, the original Mobile Suit Gundam is now on streaming, but its direct sequel, Zeta Gundam, unfortunately is not. And the only real way to get it is to track down the original DVDs from the early 2000s or to track down the Blu-ray sets. There's two collections. It'll run you about 100 bucks total on sale, which I actually don't think is a bad deal. I mean, Zeta's a full, you know, full 50-ish episode TV series. There's a lot of content for 100 bucks, 50 episodes or so. But if you're looking to spend less than that, I think you have two options. Uh, one, wait and see if the Blu-ray sets get discounted even more heavily next year. So Right Stuff and Amazon both discounted them heavily during this holiday season. So who knows? I mean, next year maybe they'll discount it even you know even deeper. Uh, and second, you can you know you could wait to see if Funimation adds it to their service because remember when Funimation announced that Mobile Suit Gundam was was coming, uh, they also said that more Gundam would come in the future. So you know Zeta Gundam would theoretically be part of that more Gundam that's coming. Um, you know, I don't know what your thought on that is, Isaac. I mean, do you think it's likely that Funimation would eventually add Zeta Gundam to their service? I hope they do because they have everything they need, right? I mean, why not just release it? <sighs> I, I, I really wish I could see it on streaming 
like today. <laughs> they, they had such success with Unicorn. Just start releasing everything else. What are you <laughs> waiting for? <laughs> yeah, I don't really get it. You know, especially with these older series. If it's the newer series, I totally get it. Maybe they don't want to put Thunderbolt up right away. I mean, they want to try to make some Blu-ray money first. Like, they definitely won't put, you know, Hathaway's Flash up right away after it comes out. You know they'll be, you know, that's new, that's shiny. And for sure, they're going to be looking for some healthy Blu-ray money, uh, you know, Blu-ray sales on that. Totally understand that. But these older series, I mean, if, if is anyone besides you and me and other hardcore Gundam fans trying to buy those DVDs? You know, if I was Sunrise, I would put out a nice viewing guide uh, with, with a suggested viewing order and then provide links to where you go watch all the old series on streaming and just say, you know what, you know, go forth and, and enjoy. Uh, especially for something like Zeta, you know, the original dub box set was fairly hard to get back in the day. And the population of people in the U.S. who have watched the Zeta dub is probably fairly small. I, you know, I feel like they should just throw that thing up on YouTube and just have people go at it. And pretty much at this point, you're probably easier getting a, a bootleg. <laughs> Yeah, the the bootleg dub that's like used to be sold at like you know the, the local anime swap meet or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we can just you know wish all we want that stuff was readily available. It's coming, people. Just just be patient. We don't know what the plan is, but we know it's happening in phases. <laughs> So, Snood Master, my hope is that, you know, six months go by and then they say, okay, we put up we put up Mobile Suit Gundam and people have had six months to watch it, so maybe they're ready for the next thing. So now let's throw up Zeta Gundam. So, yeah, I mean, that, that would make sense to me, but they haven't said anything like that. You know, no one, no one knows their plan, uh, to my knowledge. So in the meantime, I think the Blu-rays are actually a good deal. They're certainly not overpriced. Um, the one thing I'll add, though, that I think everyone should know, especially if you're a, a fan of Zeta Gundam, is that in one of Wright's stuff's recent emails uh, for like weekly deals or something um, they did highlight the Zeta Gundam Blu-rays as out of print titles so while those Blu-rays may be in stock you know, everywhere today if they are in fact out of print stock could become an issue maybe a year from now or two years from now so I do think if, if you're like on the fence about getting the, the Blu-rays and maybe you're worried that they'll go out of print one day you know you may want to buy them in the next year or so just to be safe now, if they do go out of stock, you know, I guess we would hope that they would reprint them, obviously. Um, but yeah, never know. So just something to be aware of. God, you know what? I'm desperate, not desperate, but I just really want to power through the original series and then Zeta again. And then maybe even just, you know, I'll bite the bullet. Mr. Anti-Sub, I'll bite the bullet and do double Zeta. <laughs> Ooh, here's an interesting fact for you, Isaac. I don't remember how I found this, but the other day I went down a YouTube hole and discovered that there is, in fact, a dub for Double Zeta. What? Whoa, fan dub? No. Whoa. Yes. So here's the thing, though. There are certain Southeast Asian countries that receive English dubs, um, but those dubs are typically made just for that market. So that means there's, you know, a dub that comes out over here in English and then a separate dub from a different company that also comes out over there in English. And this happens for other shows, not just Double Zeta. But over there, a company called Animax created a dub for Double Zeta. But it's considered lost media because it only aired on TV. They never released DVDs, Blu-rays, anything. Oh. So it's basically up to people who happen to somehow record those episodes when they aired to provide those copies if we were ever to see the, the full thing. So if you search around, you know, there are people on Reddit, YouTube, who have been trying to compile you know, everything they have to see, to see what they could put together. You know, they'll say, well, I have five minutes of this, this episode and 10 minutes of that episode. You know, what do you have? But I would say altogether, it sounds like people don't have any more than, you know, five episodes. And even those episodes, I don't think are very complete. Oh my uh, God, Brian, you gave me hope <laughs> and then you squashed it. <laughs> there are clips though, that you can go watch. It's not worth it for five episodes, man. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, as far as actually consuming the show, I mean, absolutely not. But, you know, if you're curious to see how it sounded, you know, highly recommend you go search for it. Just search Double Zeta Dub Animax, you know, A-N-I-M-A-X. And I'll say, you know, it's not the best dub, um, uh, but it's it's not the worst thing I've ever heard either. When I heard Judah talk, you know, it was definitely not what I expected for sure. Um, but it does exist. So here's the thing, though. Sunrise did put out Double Zeta Blu-rays, you know, here in America, but they did not include the Animax dub. So those those Blu-rays are sub only. I believe that Right Stuff confirmed that Sunrise did not want the dub released 
uh, I don't think they feel that it's up to par. Or at least it certainly seems that way. Huh. Man, I wonder what their standards are because they like, they're redoing, they redid Seed. So, boy, what mm. kind of metrics are they using? Oh, well. Uh, well, you never know. know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's coming down the pipeline. We just need to be patient. <laughs> our next comments from our buddy, Hiyakushiki23. Ooh, it's a what if question, Brian. Ooh. His question is, what if Shar did not divert the white base when it landed on Earth? If the white base landed at Jabril that early, would Amaro still be the pilot? Hmm. We sent, we sent a follow-up uh, response to him, Brian. Our response was maybe the Federation would have assigned it, reassigned it to someone like Tenneth A. Jung. An interesting question for sure, assuming they took it away from Amaro, but he stayed in service. What would Amaro's custom GM look like? And Hiyakushiki followed up by asking, by saying us, I don't know if he would have stayed in the service. Amaro, he doesn't think Amaro would have stayed in the service. He might have switched to maybe a technology side, working with his dad. Based on what General Rebel said of the White Base crew and the tragedy at Jabrow, it was to continue to fight or be kept as prisoners until the end of the war. <laughs> the Federation uh, couldn't have civilians with knowledge of the V project getting out. That'd be too big of a risk, given that it would have been before the White Base proved themselves to the feds. I don't think they would have had the option or desire to continue to fight. It wasn't until Ron Barral did Amaro commit himself to being a pilot. That's a good point. Ron Barral had a big impact on Amaro's personal development, but huh. Ultimately, I think if the Federation had more control of how things played out, no. I'm going to I'm going to say that Amaro would not have been the pilot. They would have given it to an experienced pilot, maybe one that I don't, for all we know, they had a few, you know, I imagine they had a list for Project V ready to go, right? Like people on standby almost that they, they wanted to be a pilot. You know, where did, um, what's her name? Oh God, what's her name from uh, the pilot of Gundam Alex? Oh, Christina McKenzie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was probably on a list too, just based on her capabilities. So yeah, I'm going to say they would have taken away from Amro the first chance they had, but they ultimately didn't have that chance really, the way things played out. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they definitely would have taken it away from him, right? Just on the face. If you're a high ranking general, and you don't know these people, you don't know Amaro Ray, you don't know Bright Noah, and someone tells you, hey, sir, uh, you know, our top secret project over here was it was attacked by Xeon, but wait, good news, we still have it, but bad news, it's being piloted by a child. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing that general would say is get that kid out of my mobile suit. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree, and I also think that um, Hyakushiki's right about General Revel pretty much saying, yeah, any, any of you civilians that know about this, you're pretty much under, like, I guess, house arrest or, you know, Jabrow. You put them in, they're going to lock them in, like, a barracks at Jabrow or something until the war's over. Yeah. Because, because they know too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I think their, their safety is relatively guaranteed um, because Xeon didn't seem to be making a big deal about going after the engineers and designers involved in Project V. It was mainly just to get the finished prototype. Yeah. So, and I don't think early on Zion had a, a high opinion of it, right? They they knew it was a special weapon, they knew it was an enemy, probably a, the Federation version of a mobile suit, but ultimately they didn't think it was going to be have such a big impact on how events played out. Yeah, not until it started killing all their ace pilots and their uh, and their royalty. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder, even if you had Amuro under house arrest, you know, would they have pressed him into service somehow? Uh, I have to think they would have made him do something productive by the end. Maybe. I don't know. At the same time, I don't It really... I have a feeling him being on Earth, it would be like, oh, God, space noise are here or something like that. You know, because he's, he's a space noise from a colony. Or they would have, I don't know, maybe given him back to Tim Ray, you know, father oh, of the year, Tim Ray. <laughs> <laughs> here, you got to drag this kid around. He's Federation law. He's your responsibility. <laughs> That's a good point. Let's take that one step further. So as soon as Amro tells them who he is, who his father is, aren't they going to say, okay, well, we probably can't jail you, so let's go call Tem Ray. So they call Tem Ray and they say, hey, Tem, your snotty kid's over here. He stole the Gundam and he's causing trouble. Come pick him up. So Tem comes and picks him up and Amro says, hey, Dad, you know, the, the Gundam works great. I, uh, I piloted it, destroyed all these Zakus. Isn't Tem Ray, you know, being the father of the year, as we've talked about, 
going to press him into service somehow? I mean, isn't isn't Temre going to use him to, to to suit his own agenda? I mean, he might use Amuro the rest of the war just to test Gundam prototypes, uh, you know, like the systems or something. That'd be pretty cool. Well, not really for Amuro, maybe, because I don't think he wants to do that all the time. <laughs> but yeah, Amuro might become his little test pilot for, I don't know, maybe they were working on the Alex or something, right. you know, before it gets handed off to the uh, the drop-off at, uh, at Lybot. I like how Amro's just name and the fact that people know he's Demre's son gets him out of so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really Every does. time without fail. <laughs> Unless Bright knows around. <laughs> yeah. He'll slap anybody at the drop of a hat. <laughs> All right. How about a comment regarding the UC Next 100 project? Uh, so here we have yet another comment from Hiyakushiki23. Hiyakushiki23, you're really monopolizing the comments uh, so far on this episode. I swear there are more coming from other people. I don't know why we chose this random order. Uh, but uh, here he's basically asking, you know, even though Shar and Amro are presumed dead after the events of uh, Shar's counterattack, you know, after the Axis shock, uh, spoilers from 30 years ago, uh, they could still use, you know, Judah, Camille, Amro's kid, Shar's kid, Sela, you know, even potentially kids from Camille and, and Fa if they if they had kids. So I think this is just kind of a general question to you, Isaac. F91 was sort of one way to approach a new generation of Gundam, right? None of the same characters, none of the same enemies, none of that. Fresh slate. Didn't go well, right? I mean, it went, it has its fans, it has its following. But generally, I think we agreed that F91 didn't go the way they wanted it to go. You know, the other way to go about that would be to bring in more legacy characters. So, you know, kids of characters that we've seen before. So the most obvious would be take Amro's kid and Shara's kid and put them on a collision course in the early, you know, UC 100s. Is that too cliche or is that like a safer route to go? I'm kind of on the fence. On the one hand, I get sort of a a bad feeling about it, like like the Star Wars movies where it's kind of like everyone's kids mm-hmm. fighting it out, right? <laughs> or yeah. grandkids. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, that doesn't really work good. Yeah, I get the whole we're trying to tie it to the the characters everybody grew up with and knows, but I don't know. I feel like it'd be nice to see some people come back and some people not. So maybe we'll see people older, somewhat involved or cameo type events. But I feel like it would be more fresh if we had new characters with new and interesting relationships that weren't really tied to the past. Especially if hopefully we're not dealing with, you know, Neo Zeon version six as the, (laughs) as the main threat for the next, like, you know, five series. (laughs) Who the heck would even be running at this time? Like, oh, Gato had a uh, a niece, and she's <laughs> run, she's in charge of Neil Zeon or something. You know? Oh, it's it's the Laz's angry grandson or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of agree with that. I mean, I think it's a bit too on the nose for me. You can probably get away with it for one or two characters, but if you fill out the whole cast of the new show with kids of older characters, that that's probably overkill. I definitely agree. You're probably in like Star Wars land at that point. Um, I will say that in one, you know, in one of the novel versions of Shard's Counterattack, I forget which one, or maybe it's across multiple, but uh, the character Nanai is pregnant with Shard's kid, and Biltachka, who in the movie is replaced by Chan, uh, she's pregnant with Amro's kid. So it's at least something that Tamino thought about for a moment, you know, at least. You know what? <laughs> I changed my mind. I don't want to see it. I don't want them to Skywalker like the Amro genes or the Shard genes, right? Yeah. Like, oh, their kids are powerful new types too. Who are your parents? And then they're like, oh God, <laughs> you know, like, oh, your new type count is so high. <laughs> yeah, like your N cells or something. Yeah, and then like I don't know, they're looking at like, old pictures or something. Oh, you look like that Shard guy from you know a few decades ago. <laughs> it's like oh boy, it's like they just just turn the page, keep us moving forward. There's there must be new and interesting ideas that we can see. Please show them to us. One way I guess I'd be more open to it is if it was like Sayla's kid, because I feel like you know she was a big part of the plot, and, I, and we kind of dropped her after the first series. Um, so I think that would make it more palatable than if it was just straight up Shar's kid or Amuro's kid. Because, you know, if you're Amuro's kid or Shar's kid, are you really ever going to fill those shoes? No. How? You can't. They're, <laughs> number right. one, they have to, like, oh, God, they'd have to do so much training to, like, kind of catch up really quickly, right? Or they'd have to coincidentally be thrown into those, oh, I'm just a regular civilian. I guess someone's throwing me into a gun cockpit again. <laughs> and, you know, at the same time, I have to save the Earth Sphere from 
who knows what's going to be the threat this time. Right. But no, don't do it, please. Those, let some characters have happy endings, normal. They went on to have normal lives after the war. Let's move on to new characters. Show me new people that I've never seen before with, with new and interesting lives that are filled with drama, action, tragedy, romance. <laughs> Last thing I'll say to you, Hyakushiki 23, is that one of the potentials that you called out as a character to return does actually return in the future, far in the future, with a different name, sort of. But I'm not going to tell you which one. But I will tell you it's in Crossbone Gundam. Dun, we'll get dun, to that. Dun. Dun. <laughs> All right, our next comment is from Ultimer One. Ultimer said, also, you don't have to... Ki- oh, this was about the Gunpla project, Brian. Remember we were talking yeah. about? Or mm-hmm. you specifically mentioned that you wanted to build your whole 8th MS team. That's right. So Ultimer commented, also, you don't have to kit bash to get the hover trucks and the Federation tanks. The ground war kits have both. And the yellow Gilgoo sniper idea, maybe based it off the Thunderbolt Gilgoo and the big gun. Oh, well, let's take the first part of that first, Brian. <laughs> That's cool. They have a ground war kit. I didn't know that. Probably because yeah, I only look at mobile suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually got curious after we recorded that episode. I think it was because you told me that the hover truck would be ripe for 3D printing. So I went to see if like someone out there was selling 3D printed hover trucks. And lo and behold, instead, I found the ground war kits there. So there is both a 1x144 scale and a 1x100 version. So they do exist. That said, they must not be in production anymore because they are very expensive, at least the ones I saw. Like the 144 scale, that that kit, the, the ground war kit that it's in, was like 100 bucks. Wow. I like I like hover trucks. Which is a mobile suit. <laughs> That's three times the amount of money that I spent collecting the entire Eighth MS team in Master Grade Scale. So not sure I'm going to get it. I'm definitely going to keep an eye, keep an eye on those those prices though for sure. Yeah. Wow. God. You know. You know what I'm interested in getting though. Like I think the Federation tanks are cool. Like I wouldn't mind having some of them just facing off against my my Zeon mobile suits as they get curb stomped. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you you set up a display just to show that Zeon is superior. <laughs> As you can see here on the coffee table, clearly Zeon is a superior ideology. <laughs> <laughs> and democracy is overrated. <laughs> and, and then there's a caption, and that's when the war ended. And that's when Dagwin led us all to freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Potato Head himself. <laughs> as far as the yellow Gilgul sniper idea from uh, Thunderbolt, that's pretty close to what i had in my mind except the gun's bigger and like (laughs) it's it's everything more it's everything times 20 and also no tripod or anything like that like you know some of the galgo sniper things had but um yeah pretty much a shoulder mounted just beast of a cannon yellow i've never been too much of a fan of on mobile suits i'm trying to think of like a good one that i've seen well a juagu i guess but other than that yeah the Juago is accented by the browns, though, so it's, it's not like full-on crazy yellow color. You wanted an orange one, right? Call sign banana. Yeah, I wanted <laughs> an orange. Or, I thought about orange and red, although we also did discuss watermelon, because I, I can't use red, because that traitor Char flies around in red. So I had to use a close color on the spectrum, and watermelon was determined to be is the on color because nothing in the Federation is colored watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimer had another good comment, uh, you know, after you expressed your undying love for the Noia Zeal uh, multiple times. Excuse me, everybody likes the Noia Zeal. <laughs> <laughs> Even you. I do, I do. It's a great design. You know, there's no way around that. It's probably the best looking mobile armor that we've seen. Yeah. I'm actually going to say, yeah, I was, you took the words right out of my mouth. It's the coolest looking mobile armor. As soon as you see it, you know you're in trouble. It instills fear in the enemy. Uh, you know, I like that. So Ultimer said, there's a prototype of the Noe Zeal in the manga series called Shar's Deleted Affair, uh, Portrait of a Young Comet. And in that series, they say it takes a new type to fully utilize the mobile armor. So Gato not being a new type is probably not even using the Noe Zeal to you know, its fullest potential. So the prototype Noe Zeal in that series is called the Zero GR. It definitely looks like a prototype Noiseal. It doesn't have quite as big like wings. I don't know. Would you call those wings, Isaac? Yeah. I, I don't know. The fins? <laughs> yeah. The, the manta fins? <laughs> it also doesn't have as intimidating of a silhouette as a Noiseal. Yeah. It's a little busy, actually. <laughs> and it's painted red, 
probably for sure. Crater. So yeah, there's more noise eel out there for you, Isaac. How do you feel about that? I'm happy and I'm sad. I'm sad because it's driven by a traitor, piloted <laughs> by a traitor, Shar Aznable, who, as we all know, is not Zeon at all. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But I must say, I'm glad that they uh, try to carry on the design. But ultimately, the best performance of the Noisia will always be by Gato, a true Zeon warrior. And I kind of like those colors more. It's pretty much the Zaku green. Maybe it's a shade darker or something like that, but I don't know. The green looks great in the Noia Zeal. You know, sometimes a lot of mobile armors get like the flashiest colors Zeon could find, <laughs> and it looks a little loud, you know, like they yeah. were going to like a street race or something. <laughs> I don't know. For me, the, the Noia Zeal will always be the, the king of mobile armors and the, the pinnacle of mobile armor technology. <laughs> And just a quick note on Shard's Deleted Affair. That is a very popular manga series. Uh, it's referenced a lot. I think it has a lot of good character development for Shar, so it is on our list to review someday. The issue there is that it's 14 volumes long, which is pretty long for a Gundam manga. I mean, for reference, the previous Gundam mangas that we've reviewed on here have been one volume each. And it's definitely not officially translated, and I'm not sure exactly how many volumes are out there floating around, you know, fan translated. Um, my understanding is that it tells the story of people who arrived at Axis at the end of the One Year War, kind of filling in the gap a bit between, you know, 0079 and, and Zeta. So yeah, it sounds like a fun read. That sounds pretty cool. Like, I mean, I'll say this about Shar. He might be a traitor, but damn, does he have like an interesting story, <laughs> right? Yeah, he did not lead a boring life, for sure. No, no, and he's a damn good pilot, too. Almost too good. Kind of a cheat. It's not fair to those of us that are loyal to Dagwin, trying to make things work. <laughs> He's flying around, causing problems. <laughs> Our next comment is from Zeta Plant. Cool name. Zeta Plant tweeted at us and said, Isaac's elf helpers remind me of that one girl's Gundam from Build Fighters that has the mini repair drones that come out of her backpack mid-fight to do repairs. Yeah, pretty much. I remember seeing Build Fighters. I don't remember all of it, but I'm pretty sure I remember the scene where they're repairing the Gundam. I think the drones were, they might have been brown or gray. But anyways, I'm trying to visualize or, or think of a reason why the Federation or any mobile suit or group that uses bits doesn't have bits that also do repairs. It's so rare, right? But it sounds pretty logical to have. You know, they don't just need to have weapons. Right, Brian? It does sound logical. I wonder if it's because like every unit of mass is valuable in space. And the more mass you have, the more propellant you need, or the more the more power you need. So I wonder if they just forgo that in favor of like more weapons. That would be my my in-universe explanation. Yeah. That's a good point too. And just you'd have to bring spare parts with you as well, I guess, right? That could turn into a lot of extra cargo. That's true. And if your if your mobile suit has to go so far out that you can't come back for repairs, you know, at that point they probably would have sent a capital ship just to take the mobile suit, right? Yeah. Or whatever long distance yeah. thing you're doing. Okay, we explained it away. As opposed to bits being they're, they're so much better as weapons, I guess, right? Because you're able to do so many multiple attacks from different attack vectors that it's overwhelming. Yeah. And there's such small profiles to to defend against or try to shoot down. Okay, we defeated it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not a good idea <laughs> thank you very much zeta plant build fighters try does have some really cool scenes that don't necessarily make logic in other series but in build fighters try they make perfect sense <laughs> do you think zeta plant like is his name a zeta and seed reference or do you think he's like playing up the the mole aspect like a plant you know <laughs> are you saying he's a plant either for neo zeon or the federation yeah i'm trying to figure out you know maybe he's with the titans i don't know He's with Caraba, yeah. The Titans, perhaps. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I don't know. It could be either way. It's like someone's name being spy. Like, they could be a spy for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> and Zeta Plant, I just I noticed on Twitter that he has a friend named Mr. Fin Funnels. And I don't know, when I read that, it just made me crack up. I thought that was a great name. That's pretty cool. Oh, God. <laughs> Wow, so like these these groups of Gundam fans are just congregating together, huh? At this point, we're going to form like a, a clan to do uh, <laughs> online games. <laughs> I guess we should say the name of the Gundam that Zeta Plan's talking about. It's the Gundam Portent, and I believe the drones were called the Karels, or, or maybe the Carols. It took me a long time to find this, actually. When I read his comment, I was like, he's right. That is exactly what Isaac's thinking of. 
but I couldn't remember what it looked, what the Gundam portent looked like, uh, what color it was, who piloted it, like anything. I must have buried that like deep in my memory. So it took me a while to ha figure out how to search for it. Like, what do you Google? Like Gundam with drones? That didn't didn't work. Like, I had to do a deep dive on this one. Anyway. I'm not a fan of the name Gundam Portent. There are better names to pick. No. But that's what it's called. Our next comment comes from Workhorse Diesel on Twitter. He's coming after Isaac's heart here. It looks like Workhorse Diesel does a lot of miniature work. His stuff looks pretty good. So if you guys like miniatures, go check him out. He can probably teach you how to paint these things and maybe some gunplay as well. He made his own custom 0083 remnant forces. And they've got a dom in there, Isaac. May I just say the colors are excellent also. It's like a deep purple, some pink accents along the knees and the waist, the cockpit, and then cool cool shoulder pad colors too. It looks like a bronze and a tan. That camo looking Zaku is pretty cool too. I like that one. Great combinations and great like he even did battle damage on that uh the shoulder the shoulder shield that the Zaku's wear. Mm -hmm. It's got like this cool like bullet hole. You know, I'm glad to see that the armor on this Zaku worked. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully manufacturing can catch what's going on with the other Zakus. <laughs> we should put Workhorse Diesel in charge of quality control over at Zimmond <laughs> and, um, and Zionic to get to get things under control. <laughs> <laughs> he also has this uh, bright blue Zagok, which I think is pretty cool because we don't see blue Zagoks anywhere, do we? T to my recollection. No, which is infuriating since you're underwater. <laughs> Right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Why are they not all painted blue? This thing would have been next to invisible in Alaska. <laughs> or I, think, I think Workhorse Diesel's remnant forces would have survived a lot longer than the actual forces. Probably, yeah. Well, clearly these are the superior forces since they're the remnant, right? They survived this long. <laughs> that's true, that's true. So nice work, Workhorse Diesel. We like those remnant forces. We look forward to more. Our next comment comes from Daniel on Facebook. He had a suggestion to do an episode on what are called the 30-minute mission kits. This is actually a great idea, but we've not done an episode on this yet. Um, he actually made this suggestion a long time ago. But the pandemic is still going on, so Isaac and I have not been able to make any content in person, obviously. So I'm just going to throw these out here uh, in case someone hasn't heard of them and wants to go pick them up because they're, they're pretty neat. So I'm not sure if you've heard of these, Isaac. They're called the 30-minute mission kits. Uh, they're made by Bandai, but they're not Gundam branded, but they're sort of like generic 144th scale suits, and they have like hard points attached to them, so you can buy like a basic frame, and then you buy more frames or just weapon packs, and all the parts are interchangeable amongst all the frames. So think of it as like a customizable 144th scale, you know, Gundam. Now they don't look exactly like Gundams, but they're pretty close. Uh, my understanding also is that all of the newer 144 scale Gundam parts also fit on the 30 minute mission kits. So the assembly is only supposed to take 30 minutes. Um, you know, obviously it's in the name. They're pretty cheap. I think they're 20 bucks or so each. So I think one day it'd be fun to like get a bunch of people together and throw a 30 minute mission kit party where we basically just all build one and then kind of like swap draft all the parts to, to, you know, to have everyone customize their, their kit that they brought with everyone else's parts, if that makes sense. I like this idea. We're going to have like such customized mobile suits. What do you think of the designs? Like they're kind of generic, but I think I see what they're going for here because it's all customizable, right? It can't be too specific, right? Yeah, but for 30 minutes, these are pretty cool, you know, and they don't really break the bank. And not everybody wants to throw together like a master grade or even a high grade, right? Because sometimes you're you're kind of running on <laughs> running low on steam as far as time goes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. These are pretty cool. I do it. Yeah, I think these look cool. They're, you know, there are some good designs, especially once you start swapping the parts. Uh, you can make them look neat with different colors and weapons. I'm not sure if they're still going strong or not, like or if they're you know winding down. So I'm curious to see if any of the listeners have built these before, and maybe you know, do, do you like them? Do you, are they too cheap or too generic? You know, I'd be curious to hear your opinions because I, I think they look pretty neat at least at face value. A lot of them look kind of like generic mobile suits in a way, right? Yeah, but a, but a cool generic, I guess, right? Like, they're like a Leo, but if a Leo had some attitude. Dude. <laughs> you lost our fan base right there. <laughs> Why would you say that? Okay, okay, sorry, not a Leo, not a Leo. <laughs> You're like a now, but you smile. What? <laughs> sorry, not a Leo. What they remind me of more is, like, the Gundam Age suits. Do you see that? Yes. Yes, I'll say that. Yeah, like almost like 
<laughs> we're diverting, but the, remember the games Armored Core and stuff yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. These aren't that far off. Like this is like an alternate universe where like Gundam had to like be a bit more military sci-fi realistic or something. <laughs> And this is what they came up with. So it's, I don't know. These would be like a new faction that Xeon and the Federation had to team up against. They're from, they're from a universe that only exists in like 30 minute time spans or something. <laughs> <laughs> they can only fight for 30 minutes. <laughs> so yeah, this is a great idea, Daniel. Thanks for sending it in. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we just haven't done anything with it yet because obviously we are a bit limited by circumstance at the moment. But uh, one day. We're going to do um, so many live things. We're gonna build models live. We're gonna, I don't know. We're gonna have <laughs> whose cosplay is the best live. <laughs> I think you're gonna win that for sure. There's, there's no way. Like you're gonna have some serious Zeon hat game. Sure. I'm gonna have the best Daegwin cosplay you've ever seen. <laughs> if you went to an anime convention and dressed up as Daegwin, and someone like recognized you and just shouted across the hall, like, "Is that Daegwin Zabi over there?" Would you just be so full of pride? probably like i would i don't know i would try to like <laughs> i'm not sure if this is possible but like maybe we can like reserve one of the rooms or something and i'll give like a zeonic speech and like invite <laughs> all the other fans to like get the most affordable like zeon uniform cosplay you can get you should get them and like we all like stand in formation or something and then i give a speech or something <laughs> yeah uh, I give a speech about how the Federation is corrupt and how I'm, <laughs> we're going to have space noid independence and then afterwards everything will be perfect. <laughs> yeah, and then you can go into something like really boring like why the Federation is stupid for not including mobile suit hangers in its Salamis and Magellans. No, and then I'll say how we can't trust General Rebel because he already betrayed me once. <laughs> <laughs> you also can't trust a guy who runs like a penguin, so there's that. Pretty much, yeah, that too. And, and I have to ask, keep asking people where's Garen. <laughs> And so this brings us to some of our last comments. So one of the more popular episodes that we've had, Isaac, has been our discussion about Gundam video games. People were really passionate about the games they enjoyed, so we really liked to see all of your suggestions about which games we should play, which games you like, which games you grew up with. Uh, there was quite a range of responses. There was one game and one series that were sort of vehemently recommended to us, and we did not talk about them heavily in that video game episode, so I'm going to mention them now because I think they are good suggestions for certain parts of the fan base, and you know you should probably know about them if you don't already. So the first is Gundam Battle Operation 2. Uh, this was mentioned to us by two people, actually, Rami on Facebook and Joe Phoenix on YouTube. And Isaac, this is a game I think you would enjoy immensely. I actually really wish they had this game out like when we were younger, I'll say. Oh my god. In (laughs) in high school, we would have made just a ruthless squad, wouldn't we? (laughs) Yes, yes, we would have. Totally. So, Gundam Battle Operation 2 is an online, free-to-play, third-person shooter for the PS4. Uh, It focuses strictly on the Universal Century, as far as I understand. Um, So I think already, Isaac, you're you're in, right? You had me at (laughs) (laughs) free-to-play. So it was released in Japan in 2018, and then in the U.S. in 2019. So it's really new and is free, which is like the exact kind of situation you need to be getting into a Gundam video game, right? It needs to be new because it needs to have an active player base, and it's free, so it has a relatively low barrier to entry other than you know ha- having a PS4, which a lot of people probably already do. Are there a lot of free-to-play games on PS4? Like, that's kind of weird to me. I thought most free-to-play games were mobile games. Am I just out of the loop here? Uh, I think the rule of thumb is if there's like some type of browser three to play game for like, you know, PC or whatever, it's going to be on the PS4 just because of how well Sony runs their ship mm-hmm. compared to Xbox. <laughs> womp womp. Uh, <laughs> anybody, anybody remember the Red Ring of Death for Xbox 360? Say it with me now. Never buy again. Boycott. Anyways, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think things like, um, was it War Thunder, Warplane, whatever? Those are big on PS4. So is World of Tanks. Pretty much any of the big PC free-to-play games, it's going to be on, on the PlayStation. There's no reason they can't have it there. So I figure they do this too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And besides, PlayStation is so dominant in Japan. There's no reason they would deny a Gundam game on such a large uh, platform. So the battles are team-based, uh, up to six on six, I believe. Which is a pretty good size lobby, right? It's not too big, not too small. Yeah, and there's not going to be a lot of lag, but there's oh, also right. you're not going to be like 
you know, wandering around the map, wondering where the enemy is. Yeah, so hopefully it's not like Battlefield, you know, where you spend seven minutes, like, walking to the other side of the map to try to get to where you need to go, only to get shot by an enemy sniper. And then, you know, you're like, okay, well, I guess I got to respawn and, like, walk another seven minutes to get back to where I just was. Hope you could find a vehicle just so you can get to the front line. <laughs> so the combat in this game, again, it's a third-person shooter. So it's the same view as the newer games that are faster, like the the new one we talked about. Um, what was it? Extreme uh, Maxi Boost On. God, what a ridiculous name. Uh, but, the, you know, this, this game, uh, Battle Operation 2, has combat that's much slower. So it feels like more like a simulation to me, at least from the videos I watched. Someone who's you know played the game can probably confirm that overall the movement feels heavy to me like your actions have uh, weight or or consequences i'll call it so like if you jump off a cliff you're going to jump off that cliff and you can't really change course too much like in midair whereas i bet in maxi boost on you could kind of jet all over the place and you're just changing directions all the time um, so like your steps feel heavy so if you want to walk your zaku to the other side of the map your ass really has to walk you know one step at a time to the other side of that map Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Isaac's coming for you in his in his Juago. Fast as I can. <laughs> and so like most gotcha games, uh, you know, this game operates on like a rock, paper, scissors mechanic. Three classes, you know, I, I don't know exactly what they're called, but I'm going to call them classes. So there's balanced, melee, and support. You can fight on land, in space, and you can get out of your mobile suit, Isaac. So getting out of your mobile suit, that's something you've wanted to do for a long time in a video game. You know, while out of your mobile suit, I think you can do different things like attack other pilots, attack other mobile suits, and I think you can even get in new mobile suits. That's pretty cool. Maybe you can like get to the enemy's cockpit and open it from the outside. <laughs> that seems to happen fairly regularly, like once a season, right? Something yeah. like that happens. Yeah, especially on the Xeon side. I mean, for whatever reason, they just don't keep their damn cockpit closed. Excuse me, the Federation isn't any better. As we remember in 0083, like anybody could have walked up to the GP2 and stolen it. <laughs> there were no keys or any type of locking <laughs> system. It's just yeah, first come, first serve. <laughs> yeah, I hope this game makes fun of that. Like the fact that Gundam has no keys. Like maybe you can just get into any mobile suit. They're all just push darts. <laughs> <laughs> so being a gotcha game, you know, this game has one or more forms of currency that you can accumulate usually through like playing or typically paying uh, and then you know you can use that to get more units by pulling or spinning or, or whatever you want to call it which is basically gambling for the most part they do release units I think every week or so uh, one thing I did ask Rami was if it's new player friendly nowadays because I know for a lot of gotcha games for example as time goes on the newer units always tend to outclass the older units even though you're building up your army over time so if you're starting to play a f you know a few years in now since this came out in 2018 slash 2019, I wanted to know if like if that would hurt your enjoyment at all. Uh, but Rami said that you know you wouldn't be too far behind because they do give out some some units now and then. So I think it's a good choice right now if you're looking for a Gundam game to play today. You know maybe you don't want to spend money on Extreme versus Maxi Boost on, or maybe you just want more of a simulation game. This seems like a good choice, and it has quite the array of suits available. Rami told me they're going in order, and they're currently in, like, in the Grips conflict-ish, uh, neo zeon -ish era. So they have every suit you'd kind of expect them to have up to that point. But then they also have some really weird ones, uh, like the Gigan or or maybe the Gigan. Uh, it's basically a Zeon gun tank. Have you ever seen this thing, Isaac? Oh, God, no. It's hideous. It's hideous. Let me pull up this monster right now. A monster <laughs> in a bad way, not like, you know, a powerful monster. Wait, Gigan was a... <laughs> He's a monster from from Godzilla. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, clear copyright infringement. Oh my god, this looks terrible. It's two wheels. It's not even. <laughs> god, how did they balance it? It reminds me of a Drossy. Like this is the Drossy for the ground. Did you watch the old Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon that was on in the mornings? Not the one that was on the weekends, like the really good one. I'm talking about the one that was on the mornings, like on the weekdays, that had the crappy henchmen. Oh, you scratch and grounder. Yes, it reminds me of grounder. <laughs> Pretty close, yeah. No tank treads though. It's <laughs> like, <but>, yeah. <laughs> oh god, that was. I can't believe they had two Sonic shows on at the same time, and so, one of them was like a space opera that was incredible, and the other one was just terrible. <laughs> Total tangent, listeners. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just we're '90s kids. I don't know what to tell you. Anyway. <laughs> 
it has another suit called the Gashia. It looks like an amphibious suit, but apparently it's not amphibious, and in, instead it's deployed with DOMs. Uh, so I thought you'd be interested in that. It also has the Juagu, Isaac. Good. <laughs> uh, and then as we get into the Grips era, I specifically looked for some suits I like, such as the Zeta Plus A1, Zeta Plus C1. Uh, it even has the Gundam Mark V, which I thought was crazy. Uh, and it also has the Gundam Ground Slave Wraith, which I think is pretty cool looking, gotta say. So this game has a ton of suits, Universal Century focused, very simulator-like. Again, I really wish they had this when I was younger so that Isaac and I could have basically played this all day. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a team-based co-op game, Isaac. I mean, that's all we've ever wanted, right? Pretty much. We would have roped all our friends into it. We probably would have given ourselves ranks. Yeah. We would have eventually like started wearing, I don't know, Xeon hoodies or something. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big content. Like We would have all been playing the game, but some of us would have been pro-Xeon and pro-Federation. <laughs> Tension in the group. <laughs> Some people would have been shunned for sure. Yeah, I was like, I can't eat lunch with him. He <laughs> he pilots a gun tank. <laughs> like, did you see how he approached the enemy squad last night? I cannot be seen with him. We were playing the Jabra map, and he ruined everything. <laughs> uh, so great suggestion, uh, Rami and Joe's Phoenix. I highly recommend that if you have a PS4, you go check out Gundam Battle Operation 2 if you have not already. The other series that was highly suggested was the G Generation series. I think I may mention this briefly in part two, but it probably deserves uh, more of a breakdown. Uh, so this was suggested primarily by a person on Twitter named a Flying Platypus, uh, who has a fantastic name right there. I think he or she should have a party with Mr. Finn Funnels. <laughs> so the G Generation games are strategy RPG games, but with SD Gundams. So think like Fire Emblem or Advance Wars, but with SD Gundams. So if you really like that style of game, and I think that style of game has like a pretty big following. I think the G Generation series is where you may want to look. Uh, the Generation series started in 1996 with A Generation for the Super Nintendo in Japan, or the Super Famicom, obviously. And actually, you had to have this add-on. It was called the Sufami Turbo, which I've never heard of, but that sounds pretty neat. Like, plugged into the top, or like, created two cartridge slots or something. It was kind of weird. Uh, so Bandai released six games under the Generation series A through F. Uh, each focusing on a like certain period of time. So like A Generation, I think, was One Year War. And there was a game about the Grips conflict and then Charles Counterattack or something like that. Uh, and then they eventually made it all the way through G Gundam. Uh, and then when it got time to release G Generation, they released G Generation in 1998 for PlayStation. And that one actually branched out a bit and included pilots from other series. And so since the first G Generation game in 1998, the games have, you know, they've kept coming out to this day. Uh, but they just never moved on to the H generation. Instead, they all just use the G generation name now, but they just have a subtitle. The newest game in the series is called G Generation Crossrays, which came out in 2019 for PC, uh, via Steam, uh, PS4, and I think it's on Switch as well. This game focuses on C00 Wing and Iron Blooded Orphans, and it's fully translated, Isaac, so it's quite the rarity. So you could go out right now and get G Generation Crossrays and play it in English if you wanted. Wow. <laughs> Any Gundam game translated English, it should be considered pretty rare on its own. <laughs> and another game in this series to maybe check out if you're interested is called G Generation Genesis, which came out in 2016 for the PS4, the Vita, and the Switch. Uh, but then it gets weird in a way that goes back to our Animax Double Zeta discussion earlier. There is an English version available, but I think it's only available on PlayStation and only in the Southeast Asian market. So you can't buy the English version in the I'll say normal English market. I mean, I don't, you know, what's the deal, people? It's just it's just text. Just let me play the English version over here if we already have it available. Okay. I'm guessing, like, this is some type of region-specific thing where countries in Southeast Asia that at one time maybe had English as their 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 main language like singapore or well hong kong's part of china now but you know hong kong or i don't know parts maybe taiwan or something like i do think it's mainly singapore i could be wrong someone out there can correct me but from what i remember reading i think it, it might be singapore i was about to say yeah and they just kept on having the english and if a product gets released there it better have english as one of its options or the main option <laughs> but it's just frustrating i feel like i you know i would want to play g generation genesis Nope. And I have access to one of the systems that you can play this game on, but I can't buy the English version even though I live in the main English market. Brian, you'll need to purchase a Switch from that region <laughs> to go with the game from that region. Actually, the Switch is not region locked, so that's not true. <gasps> well, what are you waiting for? I mean, 
Oh, well, yeah, I don't even know if it has physical copies. I, I don't, I think you might have to have access to, like, the Singaporean, you know, Switch online shop. Oh, oh, God. Or something. I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone out there knows how to how to buy it um, in English on a American Switch in America. Listeners so. in Singapore, now's your chance. <laughs> Tell us if it's accessible still for you. <laughs> so kind of a weird situation there, but I'm sure probably on the PlayStation side, it might be easier to find some way to get the English version You know, here in the U.S. But overall, my suggestion here is if you think the G-Generation games sound interesting, maybe those are for you. You know, check out Crossrays, check out G Generation Genesis, you know, watch some videos, see if you can get your hands on them. And then if you like those and want to play more, that's when you can go down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out what fan translations are available for the older games, because I don't think any of those were officially translated into English. I tried to go down that hole for this podcast, but then turns out there's a lot of different communities dedicated to translating these games, and that was going to be like a full weekend project to see which ones were translated, which ones were not, but they are out there. To, to some extent, at least. So one thing you'll like about the G-Generation games, Isaac, is that they do have some original characters and original mobile suit designs. Ooh. One of which is the Noia Zeal 2. Did you know about this, Isaac? I had heard rumors through the grapevine that such a thing existed, and apparently in an SD game. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a bit surprised this is where we first see it. It was supposedly going to be painted red and tested by your pal... Shaw or Aznable for new type use, but unfortunately development was cancelled when Shaw left Axis. But there is line art for it from the game, as well as, you know, since it appears in the game, we do have some colored shots. It's, again, it's supposedly painted red, but it looks pretty pink to me, Isaac. What do you think? That is not red. <laughs> that is maybe a type of magenta. We'll call it lavender. I think magenta is generous. I think we're in full-on pink mode here. The background's red. <laughs> I'll say that. But it's a pretty cool design. It looks pretty similar to the, the first Noia Zeal. Is there anything that immediately strikes you as new to this design? I mean, is the bottom thing, the bottom fin, a little bigger maybe? Yeah, that part. Also, it seems to have like a lot of spikes kind of coming out of the shoulder areas. It's got this really long, I don't know if that's fuel in the back, that, that long column that looks like it's mm -hmm. holding cylinders. Maybe that's missiles. I'd actually say it's a little busy. This is a busy rework. It's very uh, high new gun. With this side to slap on a lot of like long pieces on it and angles and all that. Uh, I kind of prefer the old Neo Zeal. Yeah. It's the high noise Zeal from the novel. Yeah. A for effort though. <laughs> but how about that, Isaac? We squeezed in the prototype noise Zeal, known as the Zero GR, and the noise Zeal Two, all in one episode. This was a Noia Zeal episode, Brian. <laughs> For all the Noia Zeal fans out there, which should be everybody, because I don't know anybody who doesn't like the Noia Zeal. If you don't like the Noia Zeal, comment below and tell us why. Yeah, you're not really a Gundam fan if you don't like the Noia Zeal. <laughs> right? Yeah, that might be a step far, but... No, no, no. Hear me out. Because almost all old armors, they look kind of, you know, next to the Noia Zeal, they look like Duplos, right? Next to like real <laughs> Legos or something, right? The Noia Zeal really blows everything out of the park. Like, it, it might be the perfect design. <laughs> I do think it's a great design. Uh, while I was looking up the Noia Zeal 2, I found something I didn't know before. Um, one of the best things they've added to the Gundam Wiki in the last like five to ten years is the section for all the suits that says what the suit was developed from and what, is de when, what it was developed into. So, for example, if you look up the Noia Zeal, it will say it was developed from the Zero GR and it was developed into two things. So not only the Noia Zeal 2, but also the Alpha Azeru from Shars Counterattack. Oh, God. And if you think about it, it makes sense. The shape, you know, I can kind of see it. That said, the finished product of the Alpha Azeru is not nearly as intimidating uh, or as graceful as the Noia Zeal. Yeah, they're night and day. One looks so lumbering and slow, and then one was just death, hell on wheels, death, death by lightning. Yeah, yeah just Alpha Azeru was just... It was a glorified capital ship. I'll, I'll say <laughs> that. It was a one-person capital ship that had bits. Big deal. And, and it was as inflexible as you'd imagine anything that big would be. The Alpha Azeru was like a space whale, but with a beam cannon. God, it looked like such a throwaway idea. Like, yeah, I don't even remember it doing much in the battle, <laughs> right? It, it took out its fair share of suits, you know, a whole bunch of Jagans for sure. I mean, Amuro certainly schooled in quests pretty easily, uh, which isn't that surprising given that she had been a mobile suit pilot for a day, two days maybe. But yeah, you can kind of see the same like basic frame structure, I guess. 
I was a little surprised to see that, but I guess it makes sense, you know, especially once you find out that Noiseal was meant for new type use and it was developed at Axis, where Char was. And those were clearly the same people, you know, working on the Alpha Azeru. So that all tracks from a canon perspective, so I like the connections, even if I don't like maybe the end result of the Alpha Azeru too much. On behalf of the zombies, I have to disagree. I'm going to disavow that the Alpha Azeru has anything to do with the Noiseal. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always that head cannon. There you go. And the head cannon's always true. <laughs> in your head cannon, the the war ended at the Battle of Loom. The war ended in a glorious Zionic victory, Brian, and and Dagwin rules over to this day. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, that was all the comments we had on our list for today. So we want to take this opportunity to thank all the listeners who sent in comments. Your comments spur a lot of discussion, give us new ideas of where to take the show, and of course we obviously really enjoyed reading them. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And we kind of have an idea of what we're planning on watching next or consuming next as far as content goes. But comment below what you think we should go to after our next idea. Yeah, if you think there's a series out there that would really just fire Isaac up and get him angry, uh, feel free to suggest that one because I think it'd be really funny to hear him rant about it. I don't know about you, Brian, but like within the course of a day, I kind of go back and forth between what I want to watch next, you know? (laughs) Or sure. rewatch. I'm like, oh, I should do this. And then I'm like, what are you thinking, Isaac? We can't do that. We have to watch this other thing. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on task, damn it. And I'm like, no, we, we should go backwards. No, we should go from the beginning. Why don't we just watch this one? This one was really fun. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably skip around a bit. You know, I think our UC Next 100 has been pretty structured. We might still have a few more entries left in that. Uh, there was another listener. His or her name escapes me at the moment, but they suggested a good game uh, that I think will be fun. It's another Super Nintendo game that I don't think a lot of people will expect. So that should be fun, too. Why not? I'm all for it. All right, everybody. That's it for this episode. Please like, comment, and subscribe. You can leave us comments on Twitter and on Instagram at Colony Dropcast or on YouTube. Don't forget to hit eject before you get killed. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs>